unsolved cases that get solved by criminal confessions often go on to become famous. In these mysteries, crime investigators have to take many precautions to ensure the criminal confessions are true, as such stories can sometimes be the only way to truly solve famous crime cases much later. Number 5 in 2005, a 19-year-old man was attacked unprovoked in London while at the barber shop by a criminal who fled on a bicycle. For 10 years, the case would remain a true mystery. The story of random crime became a famous local mystery that needed to be solved. The teenager was looking outside when he locked eyes with a stranger around his age who was riding a bike. They held eye contact before the unidentified man came inside the shop for a confrontation. He sat beside his victim and they exchanged a few words. What they spoke about has never been confessed. The man then left, only to return a few minutes later. Four bullets were let loose. The man survived and somehow the criminal who had done this to him managed to escape capture. No arrests were made in this unsolved crime mystery for 10 years until a 31-year-old man named Merci Brown walked into a police station and told them he needed to confess to a crime. Brown had lived an unstable life. After getting into trouble in London, he'd found God and became a born-again Christian. With his newfound religion, he found he could no longer live with the crimes of his past and needed to make a criminal confession to police detectives. The criminal motive behind the previously unsolved case was simple. On that day in 2005, he hadn't liked how the victim had been staring at him. Whether or not the two knew each other previously is still unknown. To fully unburden himself, Brown led crime investigators to the scene where he had buried the weapon which still had unused bullets in the magazine. This evidence gave police detectives confidence that this wasn't a false confession story and they had solved the mystery. Brown pleaded guilty in court and was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Number 4 The unsolved case of Christopher Ainscoff was finally solved when the person responsible for taking his life found him in a tough situation. Anthony Kemp handed himself in to police in 2020, almost 40 years after the criminal case, because he didn't want to live on the streets. Christopher was a well-loved man from Ireland who had moved to London years earlier. He worked as the head waiter at a restaurant and it was unlike him to not show up for work. So when he didn't show up on a December day in 1983, his employer asked police to go around to his apartment and check on him in a routine investigation. They walked into a crime scene. Christopher's body was found in the living area, battered by a heavy ashtray. The flat had been ransacked and appeared to have been wiped of fingerprints. There was one crucial piece of evidence, a cigarette butt, but DNA technology at the time wasn't enough for it to lead police to the person responsible. An investigation began, but no criminal suspects were identified. Christopher was a gay man who would sometimes invite strangers into his home. His friends had warned him of the dangers, and it seemed as if their warnings had finally come true. The stories gathered by detectives indicated that Christopher had been out the night before, but nobody could recall if he had met anybody while out. The unsolved case went cold and would remain that way until July 28, 2020. It was 4 a.m. when Kemp began throwing stones at the windows of a police station in North London. When he had attracted the attention of the officers inside, he confessed to the crime. His stories went into great detail about how he had attacked Christopher while he was on the sofa. He'd gotten into an argument about something, but Kemp couldn't remember what anymore. After one blow from the ashtray, Christopher was knocked out, but Kemp continued. He confessed to wiping the room of his fingerprints before he left the crime scene. At first, he told police he was now homeless and wanted the government to look after him. But then he decided to recant his criminal confession a confession that had been caught on tape. Furthermore, a DNA sample linked him to the cigarette butt found in Christopher's apartment. The case was solved when he eventually pleaded guilty in court, and he'll spend the rest of his life behind bars. Number 3 
One of the strangest criminal confessions ever came from a man named James Brewer. The famous mystery in this case wasn't necessarily who, but rather where. Caught up in the crime story is Jimmy Carroll, who was 20 years old in 1977 and living in Tennessee with two young children. He was very close to the rest of his family, but he also attracted the attention of one of his neighbors too. James Brewer was married to a woman named Dorothy, and he believed Jimmy was trying to seduce his wife. What evidence he was basing this on remains unknown, but Brewer confronted Jimmy at a service station on April 27, 1977. The argument ended in bullets and Brewer fled the scene in his car. It didn't take long for police to identify Brewer as a suspect, and he was arrested and criminally charged. But before he could face trial, Brewer and Dorothy disappeared, and their location would remain an unsolved mystery for decades. The Brewers went on to live a quiet life in Shawnee, Oklahoma with their daughter, Kelly. James Brewer changed his name to Michael Anderson and Dorothy took on the new surname. Nothing about their new lifestyle gave any clue of their unsolved true crime. For most of his time on the run, Brewer worked as a machinist at a local factory, while his wife joined the local church and became an influential member. When Brewer had a stroke, he retired from work and spent most of his time whittling in the shed. It wasn't until after his second stroke that, fearing he was at the end of his life, Brewer finally contacted police to confess the true story behind his real crime. Actually, it was Dorothy Brewer who called the police and told them her husband wanted to make a criminal confession. But when police arrived, she urged her husband not to confess. Brewer didn't, but said to investigators that he would hand himself in if he got better. Remarkably, he did recover from his second stroke, and true to his story, he did hand himself in. He again faced criminal charges for taking Jimmy's life, and also for skipping bail. While some of the paperwork has been lost over the years, crucial pieces of evidence like the weapon used had been kept by law enforcement. But with his failing health, Jimmy's family fears he would never face justice for the crime, even if the famous case is mostly solved. Number 2 Decorators clearing the home of an elderly man who had recently passed away discovered something that would finally solve a 39-year-old famous crime mystery. The home belonged to Harvey Richardson, and in 1970, he took the life of Lorraine Jacob. Lorraine was a 19-year-old mother of two living in Liverpool. She shared her home with her mother, who was looking after the children on the night of this true crime mystery. Lorraine was on a night out and had been to a few bars before stopping at a shop on the way home. She bought three bags of chips and left at 10.30 p.m. Lorraine would never make it home. She was found the next morning by workers emptying bins. Her purse, tights, and undergarments were missing. It was believed she passed away not long after she was last seen. An extensive investigation into this unsolved mystery took place, but no clues were found. The case went cold. It was reviewed every few years, but no leads were uncovered. In 2008, Harvey Richardson passed away due to natural causes in a hospital. While clearing out his old house, decorators found a leather satchel containing a cardboard folder. Inside were newspaper clippings about the unsolved crime and a nine-page confession letter. Also discovered were the undergarments stolen from Lorraine and an antique weapon. Richardson had never been a criminal suspect to police investigators. He was a retired librarian who kept to himself and didn't appear to know Lorraine at all. Richardson's confession letter showed that the real story was far different than what they believed to be true. Richardson took photos. The photos were described by police as not being sinister but he captured people who did not want to be photographed. These included unnerving images of an unnamed woman and even Lorraine's children. A few months before the crime, Lorraine and the woman visited Richardson's single-room apartment while he was out. They took the cameras. Richardson was angry but didn't go after Lorraine right away. It was only by bad luck that Lorraine and Richardson bumped into each other on the night of the crime. 
As the true story goes, Richardson had been drinking all day after failing his librarianship exam. When he saw Lorraine, he got angry. They got into an argument, then Richardson took her life. Afterwards, he had stolen her purse, which had a ticket to the pawn shop where Lorraine had sold his camera. But he never went back for the camera. He cut up the ticket and purse before disposing of the evidence. Richardson had no other run-ins with police, and without his criminal confession, the strange case would have stayed unsolved. Number 1 Margaret Cook was only 26 years old when her young life was taken. Born in 1920 in Bradford, West Yorkshire, she was adopted by a woman named Dorothy Gladys Willis. Her life story of hardship would soon turn into a tale of true crime. A series of poor decisions would land her in juvenile prison. She had little education and by the time she reached her mid-twenties, few non-criminal options for her future. After leaving a failed marriage that had ended in 1945 after a matter of months, Margaret moved to London where criminal organizations ran rampant. Unable to find other work, she became a woman of the night at the Blue Lagoon, a club for gambling and other less than legal activity. Margaret didn't have many close friends, but she did confide in a female housemate that she was scared for her life shortly before her life came to an unexpected end that would not be solved until years later. She apparently had a new boyfriend who was threatening her with a weapon, and an unidentified man was trying to extort her for money. The crime took place on November 10th, 1946. Margaret was in Soho, though it's not known if she was working that night or simply socializing. She was seen at about 9.30 p.m. in the alleyway arguing with an unidentified man. When an off-duty police officer intervened, the officer told the criminal to move on, which they did. Then a shot rang out. The officer and two others chased the unidentified man, losing him in the busy streets as Margaret passed away due to a bullet wound. For the next 70 years, various theories were put forward to explain this unsolved crime. Some said Margaret had been used as an example to other working girls who didn't want to give gangsters a cut of their earnings. Others say this was the work of a notorious individual named Soho Jack a very scary person who would go on to take the lives of three other women. The unsolved case went cold and would remain that way until 2015, at which point a terminally ill 91-year-old living in a Canadian nursing home made a shocking criminal confession. He told a story to police of the time that he took the life of a woman in London in the 40s, a mystery woman whose name he couldn't remember. British detectives flew to Canada and interviewed the man for more case information. He identified Margaret from a photo as the woman whose life he had ended. News reports at the time said he was of sound enough mind to stand trial, but he was never extradited to the UK. There's been no update since. For over 70 years, the criminal responsible for taking the life of Margaret Cook kept their chilling crime a secret. The man's identity, the reason why he committed this terrible crime, and what made him confess all remains a dark mystery. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.